Uh, good uh, morning, one and all. Senator Capito, good to see you. Uh, to our staffs, thank you for helping us put uh, uh, pull this hearing uh, together, this important hearing together. Today we're going to discuss the Environmental uh, Protection Agency's Brownfields program as we began to work on the program's uh, reauthorization. Uh, for nearly three decades now, the Brownfields program has proven to be an important source of help for communities uh, forced to contend with the long-term impacts of hazardous waste and other types of contamination. Uh, the program provides a federal assistance for communities to clean up contaminated lands, to revitalize the, the areas, and uh, rededicate the land to productive centers of civic and economic activity. Uh, we most recently uh, reauthorized appropriations for this program with strong bipartisan support about five years ago. I think it was in 2018. So it's uh, time now to uh, review the state of the Brownfields program and to examine what works well, to identify potential ways to update the program so that it can best meet uh, the evolving challenges that uh, communities face. I, I like to say uh, uh, everything I do, I know I can do better. And uh, that includes uh, our oversight of this program and the way this program operates through in states throughout the country. Fortunately, we have uh, four distinguished uh, witnesses uh, uh, joining, actually three this morning, and I think a third, uh, fourth uh, from remotely. but. Uh, we have three distinguished witnesses joining us in person and another uh, remotely. And uh, they each uh, possess decades of hands-on experience working with communities, uh, working with state and with local governments, um, and private developers on brownfield sites uh, across our country. Uh, Mr. Goldstein, I think, is joining us uh, remotely. Mr. Carrico uh, here, Mr. Butcher uh, here, and Mr. Pouncey here as well. And we thank you all for joining us uh, today. I, uh, if you wouldn't mind in, in, in a minute, uh, just in, introducing well, this one fellow, Carico, mm -hmm. Carico, uh, a fellow from West Virginia. That would be that would be great. We already had a chance to chat, but we look uh, forward to hearing from uh, each of you. And before we do, we want to delve into a little bit of the history of this important uh, program. The EPA's Brownfields and Land Revitalization Program began in 1995, mm -hmm. with the purpose of cleaning up thousands of lower risk. Uh, pollution sites across our country known as brownfields. Uh, the program provided the seed money and technical assistance to state and local authorities, working with private developers to revitalize uh, these brownfields, transform them. In other words, the, the program took the adversity of pollution and turned it into an opportunity for economic uh, development and, and growth. Since that time, the program has grown in both scope and in impact. Uh, in uh, 2002, Congress uh, codified the program into law, authorizing EPA to assist with assessments, remediation, with job training, and site uh, planning. In our most uh, recent reauthorization of the program in 2018, we also broadened the types of assistance that could be provided and expanded eligibility for the, uh, the program. The benefits of this program have proven themselves time and time again. According to the EPA, the Brownfields program has assisted in the assessment of over 35,000, that's 35,000 contaminated uh, properties and cleanups of over 2,300 sites across our nation, probably in every state. Uh, the agency also reports that every dollar of federal assistance leverages over $20, over $20 of non-federal money for revitalization. This has contributed to the creation of over 180,000 jobs since 1995. That's a lot of jobs for a little state like uh, Delaware and even for a big state like West Virginia. We've seen the positive impacts of the program firsthand in Delaware. Since the program began, the first state has received millions in grants, helping to revitalize areas such as our riverfront along the Christina River in Wilmington, Delaware. Once a shipbuilding site, uh, Turn toxic site. This is a site right at, close to our train station. And uh, if you go back uh, to um, World War II, go back about uh, I don't know, 60, 70 years ago, uh, 10,000 people worked along the Christina River close to the train station for about a mile either way. And uh, 10,000 people, mostly women, uh, building the ships that helped win the war uh, in World War II. Uh, when the war was over, uh, we ended up with a toxic site. And the question is what to, uh, to do about it. And what we've done about it is replaced it with uh, something we call the Wilmington Riverfront. It's now a thriving place to live and work. And we have a lot, of, uh, a lot to thank uh, with respect to the Brownfields program and this wonderful outcome. 
many Americans may remember uh, it also is a place where uh, President-elect Biden uh, proclaimed a victory after the election of uh, uh, two, uh, two years ago. So as we uh, consider Brownfield's reauthorization, this committee should examine whether specific opportunities to exist uh, to further strengthen uh, this program. I believe uh, this reexamination should include building a bond, the program's existing capacity and resources in order to help uh, local authorities with area-wide and with uh, regional planning of Brownfield's uh, remediation. Increased uh, support for planning will ensure that communities are better able to maximize the benefits of projects. And as our nation continues to grapple with the adverse impacts of climate change and extreme weather, we're reminded of that today and thinking of uh, our, our, our neighbors and, and friends down in Florida as they endure just a terrible punishing from the uh, hurricane that's work, working its way up the coast. But the program, uh, uh, Brownfield's program, should also encourage sustainable revitalization projects. By doing so, we can support community efforts to become more resilient to climate change while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, the program should incorporate just, uh, environmental justice principles and practices to ensure that the uh, people and communities negatively affected by local land pollution can fully participate in the benefits of brownfield revitalization. And finally, as we consider ways to improve the brownfield program, we should ensure that the program not only assists communities with financial and technical burdens of revitalizing contaminated lands, but also encourages stakeholders to fully engage with residents during the planning and execution of projects. Let me close, if I could, by uh, reiterating that now is the right time to uh, explore, uh, revisit uh, uh, improvements to this vital program. Uh, last year, uh, we provided EPA with a three-fold increase in funding for the Brownfield program under the bipartisan infrastructure law, which this committee, is, uh, Senator Capita knows, we literally helped to write in this room. Uh, but uh, we need to ensure that the program uh, can use these uh, additional resources to the greatest effect in assisting our cities, our towns, our communities, and our tribes. We uh, look forward, I look forward to our discussion today and the work that lies uh, ahead of, of all of us. Again, we welcome our witnesses in person and remotely. And let me turn now to Senator Capito for her remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Carper. And I want to thank you for holding the hearing to talk about uh, EPA's Brownfields program. And I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here with us today. It's a rare occasion when an EPA program enjoys strong bipartisan support uh, along this committee's dais, as we know. Since first being authorized in 2002, the Brownfields program has become a resounding success story for our economy and the environment. And since we're on the East Coast and developed a lot earlier, we have a lot of these older sites in both of our states. Brownfields are pieces of property where redevelopment is com complicated by the presence of hazardous contamination. A large variety of contaminated properties are potential brownfield sites. Common examples are abandoned factories, landfills, and former gas stations and dry cleaners. We had an issue with a dry cleaner actually in our state. These under underdeveloped properties line the streets of what are then bustling industrial, commercial, and agriculture areas across our nation, discouraging investment and job creation, reducing local tax revenues, and harming property values. Rather than viewing these properties as a stain on our community, the Brownfield Program recognizes the vast untapped economic potential these contaminated sites can um, uh, can after they have been successfully remediated. Since the program's inception, $36 billion in Brownfield grants, funding has been allocated to local communities, creating about 192,000 jobs. In addition, EPA's Brownfield's program is one of the most effectively leveraged financing tool across the entire federal government, providing a return of more than $20 for every dollar uh, contributed by the EPA. Brownfield's grants serve as a valuable financing tool for local communities and private investors by providing reliable funding and facilitating long-term reuse planning. The grants help incentivize private sector participation by reducing financial risks and shielding developers from potential liability under CERCLA. In order to be successful, the Brownfield program relies upon the establishment of effective public-private partnerships where all parties have a vested interest in the long-term restoration of a contaminated site. These partnerships help our local communities enjoy the benefits of economic development for decades to come. And while we all recognize the successes of Brownfields, we must acknowledge 
as the chairman did, that improvements are needed. This is particularly important if we were to maximize that return on the $1.5 investment the program received from the IIJA. For example, Congress appropriately intended brownfield grants to be awarded on a competitive basis. However, rigorous and complex application requirements remain a continued source of confusion within the program. Applicants typically have only 60 days to compete and submit an application from the date EPA announces another year's rounds of grant solicitations. The short time frames and complicated requirements often lead to situations where rural communities are unable to compete with their larger urban counterparts due to a lack of resources. Unlike larger cities and urban centers, local municipalities typically op are operating on a shoestring budget, lack the good fortune of having multiple full-time grant writers on their staff. This makes it an uphill battle for our rural communities when they try to compete. Uh, and as Mr. Carrico told me earlier, you lose points quickly and it doesn't, uh, he, he says he's had projects that have been 92s that have not made it. So it's, you can see how competitive that it is. Discrepancies in staff resources and experience impede rural communities from competing on a level playing field, ultimately leaving many promising rural broad, brownfield development opportunities unrealized in disadvantaged areas that need, really need them most. Because until you can clean that and re remediate, you're, you're not going to get any development around it. EPA deserves cre credit for recognizing that there's a problem. One way the agency has attempted to address the issue is through the establishment of the Technical Assistance to Brownfield Community Program, otherwise known as TAB. There are six recipients of TAB funding, and I understand the Morgantown office is a TAB, uh, uh, in, in, in West Virginia is a TAB funded um, facil uh, a place referred to as TAB providers, with each being assigned to a specific region in the country. TAB providers serve as an independent resource, assisting applicants with expert technical assistance and guidance to help them better navigate the brownfield application process. They serve as an important role in facilitating more grant applications in small and rural communities that lack their own grant writing capacity. So we are privileged to have with us today someone who has worked with the TAB program and also has worked in West Virginia for many, many years, and that's George Carrico. George serves as the director of the West Virginia Regional Brownfields Assistance Center at Marshall University. He has devoted his entire career to the Brownfields arena, helping to bring much needed funding to our state and the region. Mr. Carrico, I wanna recommend you for the high praise the West Virginia Brownfield Assistance Centers often receives from the broader Brownfield stakeholders community, so thank you. Your forward-looking and innovative approach to maximizing rural participation in Brownfield grant opportunities should be a model for other rural areas in the country. I look forward to hearing about the work you've undertaken in rural areas to facilitate economic redevelopment and community vibrancy. We're also joined by Gerald Pouncey, thank you, chairman of the Morris, Manning, and Martin Law Firm. With decades of experience in the acquisition and redevelopment of hundreds of brownfield properties, Mr. Pouncey will provide this committee with a much needed perspective from the developer's side. Mr. Pouncey's past work was praised by EPA as, as a best practice in brownfield redevelopment. He continues to receive numerous accolades, having been honored as the Environmental Lawyer of the Year in 2017, and as one of Atlanta's most 500 most influential leaders, so thank you for coming today. I look forward to hearing about how private sector participation in the Brownfield program is so important to long-term success. So I wanna thank everybody for being here. It's important hearing, and Chairman Carper, I'll yield back to you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Senator Caputo. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I just wanna add, the, uh, a lot of people, if they watch what goes on in Washington, uh, they think we never agree on anything. Uh, you're uh, welcome to a committee today where we actually work across the aisle remarkably well. And the bipartisan infrastructure bill that the president signed into law like 10 months ago, the most um, far-reaching, transformative uh, infrastructure legislation in the history of the country, we reported it out. The roads, highways, bridges, portion unanimously. Uh, we reported out the water, wastewater, uh, flood this stuff uh, unanimously. Uh, we have uh, reported out, uh, and that became part of the, really the foundation on which the, the um, uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill was uh, was built. Uh, more recently, we passed out, passed out unanimously uh, word of water resources development uh, legislation. It's for the uh, the Senate, and um, 
We've done um, similar things with recycling legislation uh, this uh, this year, and so there you go. More often than not, we find the middle and, and work toward uh, getting getting stuff done. And uh, I'm a practical politician, recovering governor, and that Senator Capito is very much a practical politician. And we're both West Virginians at heart, and uh, so it's uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to work with her her team, and we're delighted that. Uh, Y'all are with us uh, to uh, to today. Um, I uh, in in terms of uh, of uh, uh, introductions, uh, Senator Capito has already provided that for at least uh, a couple of our of our witnesses. I would add to that Mr. Goldstein, who's uh, an environmental law attorney and a leader in the brownfield development. I think he's joining us from from Florida. He is the founding chairman of the Florida Brownfields Association. I know uh, Mr. Goldstein wanted to join us in person with Hurricane Ian. Has prevented his his, his travel. I'm glad that uh, he can join us over WebEx, uh, which I understand he's literally doing through the middle of the hurricane. My parents lived like 30 years, the last 30 years of their lives in Clearwater, and uh, I think they're uh, they're under the gun there today. So we're thinking of, of them and their neighbors up and down the uh, the Gulf uh, the Gulf Coast. Um, Mr. Uh, Busher, uh, Brad Busher, uh, Brad, nice to nice to uh, to join us. The project director for the uh, groundwork. Uh, Groundwork Lawrence in uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, where I understand you've led a number of brownfields uh, uh, re re redevelopments within that uh, particular uh, area. Um, uh, Mr. Pouncey, I would add to the comments already from Senator Capito, uh, the uh, chairman. I, I, I said to him before we started, I said, well, we're both chairmen, so <laughs> <laughs> I gotta, can never have too many of them. But. Chairman of the Morris Manning and uh, Martin uh, Law Firm in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which, uh, along with Mr. Goldstein's firm, is a member of the National Brownfields Coalition. And I understand you're the principal author of Georgia's new Brownsfield legislation as well. So it would be interesting from the insights that you will provide. And finally, uh, a friend from West Virginia, uh, Mr. Carrico, the director of West Virginia uh, Brownfield Assistance Center at uh, Marshall University Thundering Herd. And we are Marshall. Uh, which uh, assists communities across West Virginia on brown, brownfields redevelopment. I told them before we started at Center Capito that my, my sister's a graduate, proud graduate of Marshall, and a bunch of my cousins as well. And about every 10, 20 years, they just knock somebody off in f college football. Uh, Ohio State, I think about 15, not Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan, about 15 years ago and earlier this year, uh, uh, Notre, Notre Dame and my sister and my cousins are hard to live with when that happens, <laughs> but <laughs> but but I'll get through it and so will they. So our thanks to each of you for joining us, uh, Mr. Goldstein. Uh, we're going to lead off with you and again thank you for connecting with us in a very very uh, difficult and trying time in in Florida. Please uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee. My name is Michael Goldstein. I'm the managing partner of the Goldstein Environmental Law Firm, a principal of Goldstein Kite Environmental, a past president of the Florida Brownfields Association, and chair of the National Brownfield Coalition's Public Policy, Redevelopment Incentives, and Regulatory Partnerships Committee. The coalition, jointly managed by Smart Growth America and the Center for Creative Land Recycling, is a nonpartisan alliance advocating for equitable remediation and redevelopment of brownfields nationwide. It is an honor to participate. Thank you for this opportunity. My remarks today are informed by three decades of experience assisting businesses, local governments, and community stakeholders remediate, redevelop, and reuse contaminated sites. Other witnesses today will no doubt speak to the magnificent Brownfields Grant Program administered by EPA, which has transformed how environmentally challenged and marginalized communities think about pollution, where they live, work, pray, and play. EPA, EPA's Brownfields program and the funding that Congress has increasingly made available beginning in the mid-1990s has given the voiceless a voice and the powerless agency. This program is constantly evolving, innovating, and reinventing. In terms of a regulatory strategy, it's as close to perfect as one could possibly want. Of course, the program is animated by the people who implement it, so I also want to take a moment to acknowledge and celebrate EPA staff in the Brownfields program and the Superfund Redevelopment Program. If there are harder working, more committed professionals in the environmental arena who make a difference in the lives of the millions of Americans every single day, I haven't met them yet. Turning to our substantive recommendations, the coalition encourages this committee to double down on the boldness of the Federal Brownfields Program by adding to the resources that are currently available, not just enhancing those on the books. 
we need to add more tools to the toolbox by one, innovating legislatively with respect to financial resources, and two, providing additional mandates to certain federal agencies to increase the regulatory firepower that communities and stakeholders can tap into. On the financial side, we recommend three new discrete funding opportunities. First, as part of a reauthorization bill, renew the federal brownfield tax deduction. Before it expired in 2011, this incentive allowed a party who voluntarily cleaned up contaminated property to deduct its cleanup costs in the year incurred. A report prepared by the coalition showed that section 198 of the tax code reduced remediation costs by one third to one half. Before sunsetting, it was used more than 625 times in more than 40 states. Second, we strongly recommend the creation of a Brownfields Loan Guarantee Program. This program would combine the aspects of the DOE Loan Guarantee Program with the New Market Tax Credits Program to leverage many billions of private sector dollars for early stage bridge financing of redevelopment projects that are considered too risky for conventional lenders. In my professional experience, there are countless projects that fail in the concept stage because they are caught in an unwinnable winnable position. They're not loan worthy until the environmental risks are cleared, but the environmental risks can't be cleared until loan funding becomes available. Third, Brownfield's reauthorization is an elegant and timely vehicle to combat the affordable housing crisis in this country. So we are recommending a significant expansion of the way in which affordable housing is funded at the federal level. To that end, we would like to see an increase of the 4% and 9% low income housing tax credit under section 42 of the IRS code to 6% and 12% for affordable housing built on brownfield sites, a stepped up basis under section 42 of the tax code of between 130% to 150% for affordable housing built on brownfield sites, and a huge game changer, a new one-time light tech and the amount of 80% of the cost of land acquisition to develop affordable housing built on brownfields. On the agency resources side, Mr. Chairman, we believe there is a much more active role that at least three agencies under this committee's jurisdiction can play in support of brownfields revitalization. The Federal Highway Administration, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the Economic Development Administration. Each of these agencies is deeply resourced, experienced, and credentialed, but to date has been functionally absent in the federal brownfields arena. First, through reauthorization, Congress should direct FHA to provide technical and financial assistance, including grant funding for brownfield redevelopment projects that are transit oriented, that invest in environmental justice neighborhoods, that provide multiple transit options, and that reduce the distance, the cost, and the impact on climate of connecting people from home to school or work and all points in between. Second, the Army Corps likely has the largest working storehouse of environmental data and information regarding remediation technologies in the country. Access to this information should be readily available to stakeholders everywhere. Relatedly, the Corps could and should publish guidance documents regarding, regarding lessons learned involving cleanup of common contaminants at brownfield sites, as well as emerging contaminants like PFAS. The Corps' rich experience with coastal communities creates tremendous opportunities for disseminating climate change-focused brownfield strategies. Also relatedly, we would like to see a brownfields grant program administered through the Corps that emphasizes climate change, sea level rise, acute public health risks, and environmental justice. And finally, Mr. Chair, through reauthorization, Congress should expand on EDA's mandate to promote sustainable job growth and the building of durable regional economies in two ways. First, by directing that EDA convene a national public-private summit on Brownfield's economic policy and priorities. And second, by directing the creation of a standalone Brownfield grant program that pulls from EDA's existing funding appropriations and repackages them to be utilized for a combination of cleanup, public health, job creation and job training activities with an emphasis on climate stewardship, energy security, and creating affordable and transit oriented housing. The National Brownfields Coalition thanks the committee for its consideration of these remarks, and I look forward to responding to any questions.
Yeah, thank you so much for that uh, thoughtful uh, testimony. I'll, I'll just say to the uh, witnesses who are here, one of the things I always look for in hearings is uh, of this nature, as uh, Senator Capito knows, is where is there consensus among the witnesses? And uh, uh, Mr. Ms. Goldstein has laid out uh, quite, an, quite a, uh, a list there. And uh, we're interested in especially to seeing what you agree with. Maybe a couple of areas where maybe you don't. So that would be helpful. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Goldstein. Um, and uh, we uh, wish everyone down there uh, in, in Florida are, are, the, are the very best. And we're here to, to help. Um, I think uh, next, uh, Mr. Busher, I think uh, you're up. And uh, we uh, are delighted that you're able to be here in person. Thank you. Please proceed. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito. And uh, Capito. Capito, sorry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and, and members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify today on the Environmental Protection Agency's Brownfields Program. I represent Groundwork Lawrence, where I'm a project director responsible for leading the organization's environmental improvement programs. Groundwork Lawrence is a community-based organization working to create high quality to create a high quality built and natural environment by renovating existing parks, creating new recreational opportunities, and stewarding Lawrence's three rivers. We transform vacant and contaminated properties into parks and green spaces to support healthy, active lifestyles. We are part of a network of independent, locally-based groundwork trusts in 25 cities and 18 states. Trusts are established with support from the National Park Service, the Environmental Protection Agency, and local stakeholders. Groundwork trusts deploy a collaborative, community-wide and people-centered approach in the development of green spaces and the restoration of the environment in the city, ensuring all stakeholders are invested in the project. I am speaking to you today on behalf of Groundwork Lawrence about the organization's work in the city of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Located 30 miles north of Boston, Lawrence is a planned industrial city founded in the early 1840s, central to the city's rise as a center of textile and paper production is the construction of the Great Stone Dam along the Merrimack River, which diverted water to the North and South Canals to provide power to the mills along its bank. Lawrence quickly became known as the immigrant city. By 1910, 90% of the city's 80,000 residents were either first or second generation Americans. And the city had become the largest manufacturer of worsted woolen mills, worsted woolen textiles in the world. However, by the end of World War II, Deindustrialization was in full force as mill owners moved their capital employment out of Lawrence to lower cost regions. The challenges associated with Lawrence's deindustrialization are significant. Abandoned mills are impacted by polyaromatic hydrocarbons, petroleum, chlorinated solvents, arsenic, lead, PCBs, and cadmium. A wave of arson and abandonment in the 80s left vacant housing lots potentially contaminated by lead and asbestos. Multiple trash incinerators formerly located in Lawrence have all been shuttered, but they left behind soils contaminated with dioxins from burning plastics and medical waste. The city's densely populated neighborhoods frequently abut industrial and commercial areas, exposing residents to contaminants by direct contact or inhalation of vapors via migration from soil into indoor air. Many of Lawrence's contaminated properties are small and interspersed throughout residential areas and present potential risk to human health for the homes and businesses surrounding them. The Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection lists 332 identified sites with environmental constraints spread across Lawrence's six square miles. Today, the city is an economic and cultural center of the Merrimack Valley with over 90,000 residents, 80% of whom are Latino. The city has benefited from hundreds of millions of dollars of private investment and redevelopment of its historic mills that now provide market rate and affordable homes for residents. Unlike many older, city, older urban areas, the city has a young and growing population fueled by the influx of Caribbean immigrants who bring new energy, businesses, and dreams. In a city notorious for ethnic tensions, there is a growing momentum behind the city's broad-based community revitalization efforts, a hardworking entrepreneurial community, a high-functioning nonprofit sector, and renewed community vitality with the election of Mayor Brian DePena, who recently led a tour of the city's brownfield redevelopment targets. 
since 1996, the city of Lawrence has received $3.65 million in EPA Brownfields program funding. The city has successfully utilized these grants to bring forth substantial economic benefits, including leveraging $12 million in state and federal funds and $51 million in private funding to assess, clean up, and redevelop complex industrial properties and the creation of more than 200 construction jobs as well as an additional 200 permanent jobs. This is related to the Union Crossing project. Lawrence currently has two active brownfield cleanup grants to support redevelopment of the largest remaining undeveloped parcels in the city. The most challenging project is the Tamborella site, a 14-acre former recycling facility abutting residential properties and a school with extensive PCB contamination. The other project is the Merrimack paper site comprised of 27 interconnected dilapidated buildings encompassing over 1.3 million square feet. Built in 1866, the site has become a perennial fire hazard, placing first responders and public health at risk. Both properties have benefited from actions taken by the EPA Brownfields program prior to the city taking ownership. EPA's Region 1 Emergency Response Planning Branch undertook significant remedial actions to address imminent public health risk created by private property owners. Groundwork Lawrence has been fortunate to support the city's efforts to reclaim Blarham Fields, to provide residents with access to recreational opportunities within neighborhoods where the poverty rate, income levels, and sensitive populations are drastically higher than the rest of the state. Central to this work is the creation of the Spica River Greenway. Over 12 years, groundwork in the city created six new riverfront parks and connected them with a 3.5 mile long shared use path, providing residents with close to home high quality parks. EPA Brownfield program funding supported remediation of four of the new parks by providing $600,000 of the over $10 million required to construct these projects. Additionally, the Land and Water Conservation Fund and community development block grant programs are vital to supporting the creation of these spaces. As this committee undertakes reauthorization of the Brownfields program, Groundwork Lawrence recommends evaluating three areas of the program. The statutory limit placed on EPA's cleanup grants is $500,000 per parcel, which is a significant amount of money, but offsite disposal and transportation costs have increased dramatically over the past five years. Another item future legislation should address is making building demolition an eligible cleanup expense. Uncontrolled demolition of buildings through fire or neglect is often the source of environmental contamination in soils that places the public and the environment at risk. Most importantly, future legislation should require strong community engagement to ensure all impacted residents have a strong voice in the redevelopment process of brownfields. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Mr. Wisher, thank you uh, very much. Now we're going to turn to uh, Mr. Pouncey. Please proceed. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman. A very personal issue to me. I grew up in a textile mill village in central Alabama uh, where my family and I worked either in the mills or in the uh, surrounding manufacturing facilities around those mills. But both of those mills are now closed and abandoned. And so I am very sensitive, uh, Senator Capito, to some of the questions and issues you raised about how do we redevelop in some of these rural or not so urban areas which suffer from the same concerns about brownfields that you suffer in the, in the metropolitan areas that uh, Mr. Busher mentioned. In discussing brownfield, I think it's important to understand the consequences of the failure to clean up these sites. In large measure, these properties have either been, as is in the case with the mills that I mentioned, completely abandoned or in some instances, they've been, they are severely underutilized, meaning they are operating on a skeletal crew to avoid intentionally certain EPA permitting requirements kicking in once they're closed. They, they become significant safety hazards, particularly to, to young children as an attractive nuisance. They represent a threat to the communities in that condition. Uh, they serve as a magnet for crime in many instances, and they also invent, uh, uh, constitute environmental risk to the surrounding communities simply because of deteriorating buildings, very often containing a number of hazardous substances, asbestos is one that comes to mind immediately, uh, and the contamination that exists in the soil or in the, in the stormwater. 
What I don't think we have focused on, and I'm going to take a, a little bit of, of uh, uh, departure from uh, the first two witnesses' comments, is the challenges that we have to redevelop these sites, particularly from a private perspective. They require these sites, these brownfield sites, require a significant upfront investment in capital and in, and in cost. Uh, very often the testing that you do to determine if the site is even viable for redevelopment, that testing can cost five to ten times what you would do if you're developing a greenfield. Similarly, you're making that investment with no certainty that you're going to realize on the ultimate redevelopment because very often those test results may say that the redevelopment is not viable because of the level of impacts that exist at that site. So we need to recognize that challenge for a private developer coming in and making this investment, that he's putting a significant amount of his working capital at risk with no certainty, in fact, with some real eyes to realize on that risk. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes in terms of the financial incentives that we've created. The second difficulty, and I say this for both as leading a lot of uh, brownfield redevelopment efforts across the country, but also personally doing some redevelopment in these areas as well, is there is an inherent delay in cleaning these sites up before you start the redevelopment. And there is an inherent additional cost that must occur with respect to that cleanup after you purchase the property. So it's not just the investment you make before you buy, it's the investment that you make after buy for purposes of cleanup. And, I, and we'll co I'll come back to that in a, in a minute as well. So the question becomes, how do we create the incentive that encourages the private sector, either on its own or jointly with the public sector, to redevelop these sites? And I would offer that one of the most effective ways to do this is to move these sites to state brownfield programs that exist, in fact, in all, in all of your states and in many other states of the uh, committee members uh, that are on this committee. Uh, and I'll give you one example of the, uh, of the effectiveness of those state brownfield programs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that, uh, that I was the author of the Georgia Brownfield Law, which we actually began implementation of that law in 2004. Since that law was implemented, simply in the, just in the state of Georgia, over 1,300 properties have gone into that brownfield program, and over 700, almost 800 properties have achieved cleanup under that program. And that is a private incentivized program for cleanup. And it's been effective not just in the metropolitan areas of Georgia, it's been effective in the rural areas of Georgia. And the reason it, like most programs, provides two things that are critical. Number one, it provides a financial incentive to conduct that cleanup. You're able to recover your cleanup costs back from your property taxes. So if I spend a million dollars on cleanup and, as, and my property, because of the redevelopment, has increased in value, I'm able to recover from that increase in value my cleanup cost. And we're also able to monetize that, which means that if I sell the property later, my buyer, who will then also benefit from that offset in taxes, that I can recover that sum from, from my buyer. That's a major incentive, which is, quite frankly, underwritten a lot of these deals that otherwise would not have occurred. The second protection it provides, which is common with a lot of the state programs that, uh, that I've discussed, is a liability protection. And Senator Capito, you mentioned that earlier, and that is, if I'm a buyer who had no responsibility for the contamination, I didn't even own the property when the contamination occurred, and I'm agreeing to come in and conduct a state or federally approved cleanup, if I don't have certain liability protections that attach to me in doing that, I have no incentive to come in and perform that cleanup. Most of the states have recognized that and introduced these liability protection provisions, some broader than others, that give you protection and quite candidly, and perhaps even more importantly, give your lenders protection so that I'm able to get the financing necessary to fund those projects. That also is important when we're dealing with rural redevelopment or small town redevelopment as well as urban redevelopment. It's having, being able to get the financing sources. 
The, the other item that I would note, and I'll pause a minute because I have, uh, oh, in anticipation of my testimony over the last two weeks, I've spoken with the heads of several brownfield programs across the South, uh, individuals with whom I deal on a, on a weekly basis. And I've asked them, what is, what is the biggest issue for them in terms of their ability to even more successfully implement these brownfield programs? And for them, honestly, it's funding for the grant programs. They, the states, we talk about where we can invest this money in, in assessments and in cleanup. And so I'd like to come back to your cleanup issue in a minute as well. Uh, do, do me just say your, your time has expired. I'm, I'm not going uh, to cut you off, but just keep in mind we have other witnesses and uh, we have to ask. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll tie this up yeah, real quickly. But they, the, the uh, predominant comment by all of these brownfield programs has been we need the funding to keep these programs active. Some of them are fee-based, but the fees don't cover all the costs of the program. And that, that is the predominant concern that I hear among those brownfield programs. Finally, I would note uh, an item that my co-witness mentioned earlier, and that is there has been a lot of money spent in these grant programs on assessment. But the real price, the real cost is on the cleanup side. And so raising the limit on the funds associated with cleanup is absolutely imperative in terms of allowing these programs to move forward. If there's one thing that I could point to, and I think that's a great comment, but that's, that's a burden where you get to the front door, but you can't get in the front door because you don't have the funds to do the cleanup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very, very much for that, for that testimony, all of it. Um, Mr. Carco, you're on. Welcome. Uh, th thank you, Senator Carper and uh, Senator Capito. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm George Carrico. I'm director of the West Virginia Brownfields Assistance Center at Marshall University. I'm here today to offer our experience in the value and importance of redeveloping brownfield properties, <clears throat> excuse me, and show our support for continuing of the brownfields program and to offer some input on how this valuable program uh, can be strengthened. Our Brownfield Center works in conjunction with the Brownfield Center at West Virginia University. These centers were established in 2005 by state legislation to assist communities and organizations across West Virginia in redeveloping brownfield properties for new and productive use. And we've seen firsthand the importance of EPA Brownfield's funding, how these investments have, re have uh, resulted in, in strengthening of local and regional economies while adding new community vibrancy and resiliency to our cities and towns. Reutilizing brownfield properties for new commercial and industrial businesses, residential use, government, recreational use, it's been quite prosperous for several communities, and it's our goal to see more successes, especially in our smaller and more rural communities. And West Virginia is just like most states. We've got thousands of brownfield properties found in all sizes and conditions. These properties can be quite challenging to redevelopment, primarily due to the, enviro the environmental hazards that they can that they contain or are perceived to contain. Properly assessing and if needed, remediating environmental hazards is vital to transforming these properties into new productive use while ensuring the future safety of human health and the environment. And EPA Brownfield's funding is providing this vital component. So since 2005, our centers have seen a wide variety of successful Brownfield projects EPA states they've invested approximately $41 million in brownfield funding in West Virginia, resulting in an estimated $1.6 billion in leveraged funds and creating about 5,400 jobs in our state. While I can provide dozens of examples, I'll quickly focus on three different but equally important projects that illustrate this success. The first one is the Shepherdstown Library. Uh, Shepherdstown is one of the oldest towns in West Virginia, and they were in dire need of a new uh, library building. As the old building was way too small and uh, they had inadequate parking, uh, lots of issues there. The most suitable location that could provide enough space was identified at the edge of their town. And decades ago, that was the former town dump. The site was fully assessed and corrective actions were conducted. And in July of this year, the town celebrated the opening of its new library. 
Second example is the Huntington Fire Station. This brownfield site consisted of a former gas station and a dry cleaner facility. Brownfield funds were utilized to assess the property, identify the hazardous contaminants in the soils and groundwaters. Uh, the, the site was entered into the West Virginia Voluntary Remediation Program. And just recently, a certificate of completion was issued. Now, a new and strategically located fire station is under construction. Uh, last example I'll give you is the Beach Bottom Industrial Park. A steel mill operated here for decades along the Ohio River. After closing and sitting vacant for many, many years, brownfield funding was used to assess and remediate the site. In August of this year, it was announced that an electric pontoon boat manufacturing company will be the first tenant on part of the property, providing 100 new jobs and investing $5 million into the, into the facility there. These are, again, just a few examples of projects where EPA Brownfield's investments have played a critical role. If this funding were not available, most of these projects would not have happened. This funding gets environmentally impacted properties ready for new use, clearing the way for other funding streams to be utilized that, that will result in successful projects. While we have a lot of success stories, we have many, many more sites that still need attention especially in our smaller communities and our rural areas, where the number of brownfield properties may be less, but are just as equally important. Due to limited capacity and resources, it's much more difficult for these smaller communities to compete against the larger cities and urban areas. Successfully applying for brownfield grant funding and meeting all the requirements can be a daunting challenge for these communities, and they're often at a disadvantage to successfully compete. So in closing, I'll say this. The EPA has numerous programs that are of tremendous value and importance to the U.S., but we, like many others, we consider the Brownfield program to be their crown jewel. Some changes to the competitive process should be considered to make it easier for smaller communities to compete, but the Brownfields program is definitely a true champion. I, I thank you and look forward to your questions. We uh, had been looking forward to your testimony. Let me just say uh, you've uh, met and exceeded, all of you met and exceeded uh, our um, hopes. Uh, and uh, I want to, again, commend our staffs for finding you and getting you, convincing you to come and join us, at least three out of the four. Uh, I, uh, I, I already telegraphed my pitch and, and indicated one of the things I'm looking for is uh, finding uh, consensus. Uh, we uh, work pretty good in this uh, committee and finding consensus on major issues. I mentioned some of those uh, earlier. And uh, I, I'm going to just start off by, by asking each of you to briefly respond to this. But uh, uh, we'll start, Mr. Boucher, with you, Mr. Richard, with you. I'm interested in uh, two, uh, two areas, two ideas where you think there is consensus among the four of you that are important that you think we should really pursue. Like all the things that you've heard it said, listened, we're, we're a couple of really great uh, areas that we can pursue, could, could pursue, should pursue, because there's a lot of consensus. Um, well, I spend a lot of my time building parks, and there's never enough money to, to do everything that the community wants. Um, as illustrated by my testimony, um, EPA cleanup monies provides a very small sliver of the overall amount of funding provided to construct these spaces. Um, communities are then obligated to maintain that engineered barrier to make sure that the space is safe for residents. So the statutory limit increase is important. And I would also go further to say that sites that remain fallow but have received uh, funding from the EPA should, should also, previous funding for cleanup should also be eligible for additional cleanup funds. The, the statutory limit used to be 200,000. Um, so, so I think there's consensus on, on increasing the statutory limit. Um, the second area where I think um, we didn't hear it from, from the individuals today, but, but I know listening sessions in Region 1 really highlighted the, the need for uh, building demolition to, to be el an eligible cleanup expense. It's, it's pretty wild that a mill building has to burn and the contaminants have to end up in the soils to be, up for, to be eligible for cleanup. Good, thanks. Uh, Mr. Pouncey, two, just crisply, two, uh, two areas where I think there's a good deal of consensus that we ought to drill, drill down on. Uh, the raising the limit on the remediation cost component uh, is, a, is a big issue. 
uh, for purpose of these grants. Once again, as I mentioned earlier, you can uh, very often you've got the assessment money, so you get to the front door, but you can't walk in because you can't afford the cleanup. Mm -hmm. uh, I would consider that to be a significant item along with, as part of that, including demolition cost. Uh, the second item with which I would uh, agree, and I think uh, Mr. Goldstein may have mentioned it, but that is the re uh, reintroducing and enacting or uh, extending the Brownfield uh, tax credit, which allows you at the federal level to expense your cost uh, in the year that they're incurred from a remediation standpoint. Okay, thank you. Uh, same question, uh, Mr. Mr. Carrico. Yes, first of all. A couple of great uh, ideas that you think there's a lot of consensus around. Yeah, first of all, I completely agree with the cleanup aspects. Um, I will add, though, one good thing, this round of current funding that's that's come up, there are actually three layers to the to the cleanup grant process, or three levels of funding, 500,000, a million, and two million. Now, the higher grant numbers, the funding numbers are reduced number of grants. Probably needs to be more in that higher level, but it's good to see that that is advancing because it's costing a lot more to remediate sites. Second, I want to give a big amen to the demo side. Finding demolition money is always a, a, a very, very difficult one. And then the third one I would add is, is the complexity of the application process for smaller communities with their limited capacity and their resources. Uh, it is very daunting and challenging for them. Uh, it's very hard for them to compete against your larger cities and urban areas. So um, putting in some, some items that could help them to where they can compete on a little bit more level playing field would be a, a, a great benefit for everybody, I think. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks for those. Mr. Goldstein, are you still with us? Absolutely. Following yeah. along uh, very, very closely, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Uh, I, my first item where I see consensus starts with an observation that Ranking Member Capito uh, made, and that is with respect to uh, reforming the grant administrative process. It's uh, overly burdensome, and if we could streamline that, that would, I think, increase the competitiveness of not only rural communities, but environmental justice communities who are also under-resourced, even though they're in urban areas. Uh, that's number one. Uh, and amen to the amen that we just heard on including demolition costs um, in, the, in the grant process. But the, the second main area of consensus I see is with uh, my brother, Gerald Pouncey, and that is finding a way to um, have EPA relinquish jurisdiction on sites with primary federal enforcement so we can get those sites into state brownfield programs where they can enjoy a state-based liability incentive, liability protection incentives and economic incentives. And in many states, including in my state in Florida, the two are mutually exclusive. If a site is under federal enforcement, it is ineligible to participate in a state brownfield program. So I think that there's a lot of bang for the buck in, in, in looking at exploring that relinquishing of federal enforcement jurisdiction. Terrific. Thank you for those uh, those thoughts. Senator Ernst, uh, Senator Capito has graciously offered to step aside and let you go ahead and ask your questions. Thanks for being a faithful attender of these hearings. Thank you. I know I appreciate that. And had a tough battle here with the chair when I got in, but uh, I won. Let, so. let the, let the uh, record show Ernst won. I, chair, well, I won this one, right? <laughs> won this one. But thanks to all of our witnesses for being here today. Really do appreciate the discussion. Uh, the city of Des Moines has recently gained ownership of what is known as the former DICO uh, site, which has been on the EPA's national priority list since 1983. So Des Moines has actually taken a number of steps uh, for, forward in collaboration with the EPA and the Iowa Department of Natural Resources to, in an attempt to redevelop this property. Um, the goal is to house a professional soccer stadium and bring economic development opportunities to the community. However, there's always a however. Um, however, sites on the national priority list are not eligible uh, for Brownfield's funds. Uh, so Mr. Pouncey, in your experience, how many sites have you worked with that are no longer owned by that original pollution source such as the DICO site in Des Moines? Uh, uh, many, many, and it's, uh, and, and I would offer to the entire committee, and one of the things that, uh, that 
uh, that we have met with EPA regarding is the effort to get these sites off the national priority list so that they can be eligible for state programs that allow for the items which I mentioned earlier, which is tax relief potentially, which is liability protection for the buyer that is coming in to buy that site and redevelop the site. Uh, we have also introduced the concept of partial deletion, which means even though all of the site may not be removed, at least the lion's share of the site can be removed from the NPL. So that portion we would be eligible for the state program and can proceed through the state program. That's wonderful. I think you just answered my second question then. I was going to ask if you believed it would be appropriate for sites um, who have transferred that ownership then to be eligible for those um, Brown, Brownsfields funds. Um, so absolutely, I, I think we have work to do there. We are blocking a lot of really great economic development by not engaging uh, with those properties. So um, I really do appreciate that. Uh, and Mr. Carrico, did I say that correctly? Okay, thank you. Uh, given your experience, what steps uh, do you think would be most impactful in streamlining uh, both the Brownsfield's uh, grant application and the implementation process? Streamlining the process. Streamlining. <laughs> that would be a wonderful step in the right direction. Yeah. It is extremely cumbersome to put these applications together. Uh, I mean, we work with communities, uh, as an example, we've been doing webinars with communities this past summer telling them about the grant process and, and helping them to understand this is not for an easy task that you're about mm -hmm. to encounter. Trying to take them through step by step what's required in each of, in each of these uh, uh, applica in the, the overall application process. So by being able to streamline that a little bit, uh, there's, a, there's so much information that's required. It gets down into the uh, things like health statistics, cancer rates, lung diseases, all these different things. And as EPA says, they, they want you to tell a good story with your application. You've got to fit the contaminants that, you're, that are in your community that you're looking to deal with uh, against those health concerns. That, and a lot of times, especially in our more rural communities, it's hard to get that data that can be presented. So we're already at a disadvantage, and then you lose points for that because you, you can't score well in that particular category. Um, we, should put more, we should make sure we keep more of the focus on assessing that property, figuring out what's there, what needs to be cleaned up, and then figuring out the strategy to do just that, then apply the cleanup grant funding to go do just that. Right. I mean, it, simplifying that a little bit is going to help all of us down the road, uh, especially, again, with our smaller communities. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, thank you so much, because I do think that's important as well. Let's let's get on it. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member Capito, and, of course, uh, Chairman Carper. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you so much. I'm glad you conquered your chair. That's very good. <laughs> uh, Senator, Senator Cardin has joined us from uh, uh, from Maryland, and we've been joined by the Senator from Alaska, Senator Sullivan, and by uh, uh, and Sheldon, Sheldon Whitehouse. W welcome, uh, Ben. You're recognized. Well, first of all, let me thank the chairman and ranking member for conducting this hearing. Uh, the the Brownfields legislation has been critically important. Now, I represent the state of Maryland. So let me talk about Trade Point Atlantic, which is one of the largest brownfield sites in the country. Uh, for those that are not familiar, it was the Sparrows Point Steel Yards from the 1800s to 2012. At one time, it was the largest steel producing facility in the United States. Uh, when it shuttered in 2012, there was close to $70 million of immediate work that had to be done to clean up the environment. So today, as a result of the Brownfields legislation, this uh, property has been reprogrammed. We now have Amazon, Home Depot, Under Armour, BMW, Volkswagen, uh, we have the DOE offshore wind initiative. Uh, we have, as well as large rail yards connecting two class one railroad CSX in Norfolk Southern. So it is, a, it is a hub for economic growth for the future, transitioning from a steel yard production facility to its modern needs. So I'm a strong advocate for brownfields and for the legislation uh, that we are talking about today. 
But I just would like to focus on one aspect of it as to how we could do perhaps even a stronger job. We know that most brownfields are located in challenging communities. That's, they, these are older communities by definition and had older types of facilities. So how do we focus the legislation to be more effective in regards to environmental justice and helping the underserved communities? I, I welcome your thoughts as to how, as we look at reauthorization, how would we want to provide additional incentives so that we can reach those communities. Sometimes these brownfield sites might be kind of small. Other times they may be large. They may be located in urban centers. They may be located in rural communities. But how do we deal with the unusual commitments to communities that don't have the same resources that other communities may have uh, in their brownfield sites? Who's the first witness, uh, uh, what person willing to, to help here? Go ahead. I'm happy to um, yes, sir. I'm uh, happy to try to answer that. Again, I'm, I'm in West Virginia. We have a little different setup there. We actually have two Brownfield Assistance Centers. Our state legislators legislation put that, those into effect back in 2005. So it's actually our job to go out and work with local communities to help them to understand the daunting challenge that's the, of going after these grant funds. And, and it is literally hand-holding 101 step by step getting them th to understand uh, what the environment contaminants are all about, how do you address them, all the different uh, issues that, that, that are there. So, so we're doing that in our state and we've had a lot of success with it. Um, the tab providers. Are, are we helping you do that? Or is oh no, sir, this, this is- uh, So how funding. can the federal government right. help you do this? So um, you have the tab providers, the technical assistance providers that EPA has throughout the, the country. I think there are six of them, if I'm not mistaken. My counterpart uh, at West Virginia University is one of those tab providers. So they work in EPA Region 3, for example, to do that same thing, to start interacting there. There probably needs to be a lot more work done there if you're going to get out to those more rural, more smaller communities. And I, and I have to tell you, uh, it takes a whole lot of one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings in order to really get them on board. And I, pre I agree with you. So you're saying we could help the federal government in providing the, the resources for technical assistance for communities that have challenges working through the application process for grants and eligibility. Can we make the grants a little bit simpler and more focused to make it easier for these communities? That would make us all happier, I can assure you. <laughs> uh, and. Again, for our smaller communities, they're, they're really uh, kind of a step behind just because it's very difficult to be able to pull all the needed requirements into those applications. And if you, if you don't score well in just one little subsection of an application, you probably won't get funded. As was mentioned earlier, we've had projects that scored 92 points out of 100. In school, that's an A paper, but these were not funded because they didn't score high enough. I know my time's over, I'm just about out, but I understand Mr. Goldstein might want to add something to yes. this. And he's, he's, I know he's I'm, out, I'm out here in the, I'm out here in the Brownfields ether, but I'm listening uh, carefully and, and, and eagerly. And Senator, thank you for your question. I think there are two specific um, strategies that the federal government can employ to address your important concern. One is to overly induce the private sector. Here in the state of Florida, the, the legislature has put its thumb on the scale for affordable housing on brownfield sites and for access to health care on brownfield sites. And in my earlier testimony, I suggested ways in which the federal government could provide heightened subsidies to affordable housing developers through the low-income housing tax credit program for developers that invest in communities that need critical affordable housing. I also provided testimony regarding a brownfield loan guarantee program, which in my experience would likely move billions of dollars off of the sidelines and private capital into um, rural and environmental justice communities, provided that you incentivize those loan guarantees in that fashion. So that's on the one end, using a broader basket of financial tools to overly induce the private sector and just make it a bad business decision to ignore rural communities and environmental justice communities. 
and then the other the other leg of the approach, the second leg of that approach would be to super empower those EJ communities and rural communities by uh, providing them direct and unique access to other federal agencies with massive resources that currently aren't in the federal brownfields arena, like the Army Corps of Engineers, like the Federal Highway Administration, like the um, Economic Development Administration, and other agencies that don't have that this committee doesn't have jurisdiction under, on like for example HUD, but that those are two very um, discreet and I think meaningful and material approaches that could help you execute on that important issue that you, concern that you've identified. How do we help those communities where um, uh, the uh, current marketplace hasn't um, uh, organically uh, produced an incentive for private sector investment? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Chairman Carper. I had to go to uh, a uh, Homeland Security meeting, so he handed me the gavel, which I love. Um, so I'm going to do my questioning, and I'm going to start with you, Mr. Carico, and thank you for coming from uh, from the beautiful state of West Virginia. I think we've pretty much made the case here by everybody that uh, rural areas, uh, whether they're EJ communities or not characterized as such, need more capacity, need more help, need uh, and need maybe a different lens to which to look look through. So I'm going to ask you a little bit more specific question. I understand that um, you're allowed to have administrative costs of 5%. Is that correct? Is that an accurate figure? Should there be more, uh, less? Does that reflect well on uh, meeting the needs uh, administratively? Now, first of all, some years ago, not, not too many years ago, uh, you could not uh, have any administrative costs. So mm -hmm. First, it was great to see when EPA added that 5% administrative uh, cost fee. That, that, was, that was really good for everybody. Uh, from what I can tell, and this is just my opinion on the, on the matter and the folks that I work with, for our larger cities and our larger urban areas, I think the 5% fee is actually fairly uh, sufficient for them because they've, they've got staff, they have other resources, uh, et cetera, that they, they can draw from. For our smaller communities where they don't have uh, that many resources, uh, they don't have the capacity, et cetera, possibly a little bump up to that, uh, to, to that 5 percent allowance it, it would definitely be of help to them. Uh, but I would also add this as a, as a caution, if, if I could. The vast majority of the funding should always focus on uh, assessing those sites, figuring out what the contaminants are, and all those all the other things that's needed, followed by the cleanup. That that the primary funding should always be be focused on that, with a secondary focus on your site redevelopment and, and planning gaps. So again, the five percent is great. Maybe bumping it up a little for our smaller communities would would probably help them out a little bit more. Maybe not 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 too big of an issue for some of our larger. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pouncey. You, you your testimony really uh, I think brings into focus uh, the partnership aspect of this. So you, you talked about the state of Georgia and what, what you're doing there. Uh, uh, you've all talked about states that are, are active here. Uh, and then also the private developers aspect of this. So as you're looking at that in terms of, and I know you've mentioned some tax uh, issues that would be helpful opening up to demolition and we need to do demolition not just on brownfield sites, but on urban areas that and and rural areas that just have these uh, dilapidated, uncared for properties that nobody's going to. They're, they're havens for ill use and uh, and unsafe and unhealthy. So, if you're looking at how would you improve those and strengthen those partnerships? I mean, uh, to make sure that we're maximizing all the benefits. And I am curious to know as well because I did work on the opportunity zone um, uh, legislation with Senator Scott. Are you, you are you all using that? And can you use that in this whole universe of brownfield brownfield re, re, redevelopment? And has that been useful? Yeah, uh, Senator, I'll address those. <coughs> excuse me, in reverse order. Uh, yes, the opportunity zones play a huge role in uh, in our redevelopment activities, and I think a number of the uh, uh, a number of the changes that are proposed, I think, are, are, are worthwhile changes. We've seen uh, we've seen census tracts and areas that have grown out of poverty. Mm -hmm. It may no longer be appropriate for treatment as opportunity zones, okay. but uh, but certainly they provide a real incentive uh, for 
patient capital to come in and restore and help redevelop some of these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. On the public-private partnership, and perhaps let me speak to the, to the grant issue first. Uh, respectfully, uh, we have seen many instances in which the grants funded testing, but that testing was really for no specific purpose toward cleanup. And as a result, at the end of the day, nor for redevelopment of the community or improvement of the community, as a result, at the end of the day, it becomes a report that goes in to someone's desk mm -hmm. and, and sits there. I'd, I would propose, and we have championed in some instances, uh, the local communities who are applying for receiving these grants, partnering with the private sector as well. So there is a real opportunity because so many times the cleanup occurs as part of the redevelopment itself. Right. The, the, the dirt that is moved, the yellow iron that is out there that is, is moving this dirt and, and is going to be there whether it's construction or whether it's cleanup. It's just where the, where the material is taken afterwards. And so I do think there's real benefit in the local communities that are applying for or receiving these grants, partnering with the private sector with interested uh, entities or developers that can come in and say to them, here's the testing we need to come in and do this redevelopment, which very often includes both a public and a private component to it. I think I would suggest that's one way to more effectively use or ensure the effective use of these funds okay. is having that public-private partnership mm -hmm. at the outset mm -hmm. before the assessment begins. Okay, thank you. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, welcome to all the witnesses. Um, I think we can probably all agree that uh, Superfund sites uh, burning or flooding is a very bad outcome. Uh, seeing lots of heads nodding. Um, and uh, for that reason, um, wildfire and flood risk is important in dealing with uh, our existing and emerging Superfund site uh, population, if you will. And um, GAO did a report titled, EPA Should Take Additional Actions to Manage Risks from Climate Change, in which GAO found that EPA had omitted, omitted climate change from its agency strategy and further, that many Superfund sites would be at increased risk of flooding and wildfires. Um, and that, obviously, if you've omitted that from your risk calculation, you're, you've kind of missed the pitch. So my question to you, um, and I guess I'll start with our voice from the ether, if I may, uh, Mr. Goldstein, is what did we lose in the denial of years when EPA wouldn't count climate change into the uh, Superfund risk factor? And have we caught up uh, for the whatever went wrong in those years? And how prepared are we now uh, in terms of a proper scientifically based accurate assessment of which Superfund sites face new risks from flooding and from wildfire? Mr. Goldstein. Well, I, 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 think, that, I think that the industry and the agencies, both at the federal level and at the state level, are catching up very quickly. There is and has been over the last, I would say, five or six years, a very uh, significant effort to understand uh, the remedies that are appropriate to implement for contamination in coastal zone areas that are acutely subject to sea rise and whether those remedies uh, should continue to include encapsulation of waste on site or, or source removal. This is an ongoing discussion that has technical implications, regulatory implications, legal implications, economic implications and um, uh, equity implications. Uh, not all cleanups are created equal and not all cleanups are, are, are 
are financially uh, sourced or viable in the same way. And this goes back to some of the testimony that we've heard in this hearing and some of the testimony that I provided regarding the ability of the federal government to achieve better outcomes and better results in the age of climate change by um, putting our thumb on the scale with respect to certain outcomes and approaches to cleanup where here specifically we could uh, the legislature could congress could prioritize source removal uh, in coastal communities the removal of all impacted contaminated soil or sediments so that when waters rise from below or fall from above the uh, caps that are in place which may no longer be an effective remedy uh, are are not an issue because the the uh, source of contamination Thank you. Um, I've got a minute left, so if I may, let me ask the other witnesses to offer whatever thoughts they may have in response to those questions as responses for the record and put them in writing. It wouldn't be right for a Rhode Island senator not to say a kind word about uh, the Rhode Island role in establishing brownfields, um, led by uh, chairman once of the Environment and Public Works Committee, John Chafee, whose picture is right in that room as one of the uh, former chairman of this committee, and then reauthorized by his son, Lincoln Chafee, uh, years later when he uh, assumed his father's seat. So we take a certain amount of uh, pride in the Brownfields program around Rhode Island because it has good Rhode Island fingerprints all over it. Uh, another Rhode Island credential that relates to this is that um, the Rhode Island Coastal Resources Management Council and the University of Rhode Island have worked to improve the mapping of flood risk along the Rhode Island coast because we discovered that the FEMA mapping was absolutely horrible. It was terrible. If you followed the FEMA mapping, it led to internal inconsistencies within its own program. It produced results for worse storms that were lower than what was measured for actual less bad storms. It's like, how is it possible that you could come up with a flood risk map that shows for X level of storm, it's gonna be better than we actually experienced for a lesser level of storm? It doesn't even make sense. The sloppiness of the FEMA process, the inconsistencies within the FEMA process, and the flinch that they had about looking at sea level rise because, oh my God, you might have had the touch on climate change, and oh my God, we can't talk about that. It just created a disaster. And, uh, the state really stepped up and has done absolutely first quality mapping. And I encourage anybody who is in that predicament now to take a look at what Rhode Island did. The Storm Tools, it's called the Storm Tools app and uh, uh, resource is really pretty remarkable. Unfortunately, it tends to be coastal, but I'm sure that in West Virginia, some of those rainbow storm floods have a similar uh, outcome on, on folks. So I'll just want to say those thank yous to uh, Rhode Island much appreciated. Well, I'll thank Rhode Island as well, and I can t speak to the two 2016 flood where the maps in Raynell showed that uh, there would be no flooding, and they were flooded, I don't know, six to eight feet in these houses. And if you talk to people in the community, they would say, oh, sure, sure they flooded. That They get water in their yard every spring, so they knew. But the maps showed no, and these folks hadn't bought any flood insurance, so it didn't have a very, uh, a very happy outcome for many of them. So here's a question I wanted to ask everybody. So you've, we've talked about successful Brownfields um, applications and projects that you've worked on. Have you ever had a project where you looked at it for a Brownfield and you deemed that it would be, A, not worth the effort or something that was premature? Um, I don't know. We'll start with you, Mr. Carrico, and then we'll go back through the whole group. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, and the answer to that short answer is yes. Uh, many times we interact with the community. I'll, I'll give you an example. In, in the little community of Mullins, had a little project there, and all they needed when all, all was said and done was about $30,000 to do some asbestos abatement. The EPA Brownfields program is not the route to go to try to go get that funding. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just way too much effort and, and for, for that one single project. We do often sit down with, especially, again, our smaller, uh, more rural communities, and after meeting with them, going through all the details, we tell them, you're not ready to try to get into this Brownfields arena. Mm -hmm. Maybe then we try to help them with one particular site. You know, they have 
they, they've got a little site inventory and it's their, their most, uh, it, it's their highest ranking site they want to try to, to do something about. We try to work with them on that one site and that kind of gets their appetite wet and gets them to learn the process a little bit and then prepares them to where they can move on, you know, right. forward uh, into the Brownfields arena. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let these other fellows yeah, Mr. Pouncey. comment as well. Think of two categories of sites that 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 we've had to walk away from. Uh -huh. uh, one are sites that are on the national priority list because it just takes so long to get those sites off the list. Uh, we've that's the super fun part. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. We we had one where we spent uh, close to fifteen years to ultimately get it off the national priority list and went through four series of purchasers because. Oh. The, the lack of patience, the, they, just, they just couldn't wait right. that amount of time to get it off. So that's, that's one category. That's why I think it's so important to develop innovative ways to get these sites off the Superfund list. Uh, the, the second is, uh, is uh, less subject to how you correct it, but it's simply where we're approached by a developer for a particular type of use, and it turns out the site just wasn't appropriate for that use. And that, that may be if you're looking at a single family or multifamily residential development uh, and the cleanup is such that it's really only going to support uh, an industrial use or a uh, mm -hmm. warehouse last mile use or something like that. Right. Thank you. Mr. Brashear? <clears throat> yeah. Um, we, we have two types of sites in Lawrence. We have scatter sites, smaller properties, smaller industrial properties in residential areas, and then we have large properties with great proximity to transit, to highways, um, riverfront properties as well. The, the, the ones that are along the, the waterfront, close to transit, they, they're gonna find a, a private partner to, to complete that redevelopment and to really show that leverage that the EPA Brownfield program is so known for. But when you get to the scatter sites in residential areas, the smaller industrial sites, less than an acre, with triple deckers or high density housing right adjacent to them, um, the end use is not very visible, and the partners uh, <laughs> with the Brownfield's expertise required to reposition these and get them back on the tax rolls, they're, they're, not, they're not really out there. So mm -hmm. you're really relying um, quite frequently on somebody like a groundwork to come in and do a park or, um, or a community-based organization, community development corporations that's going to take down the site and hopefully create some housing. Um, but at the end of the day, it all requires a private partner who is willing to take on the risk associated with this redevelopment. And, and if the market is, is moving fast, you're likely to have more traction. When, when the real estate market is slow, um, things tend to slow down. Right. Mr. Goldstein? So on our end, um, we, from time to time, experience many of the factors that the previous witnesses mentioned. Florida has been blessed with a, a very active economy. And, the, and so that hasn't been a significant driver in terms of having to walk away from brownfield sites. On our end, what we find most as being a, a, a too significant of a hurdle to overcome is where the public health risk is acute, where there has been actual injury to public health and um, claims may be asserted or may be assertable in the future with respect to public health that could be um, absorbed by a prospective purchaser. That makes redevelopment um, very difficult. Yeah, I think Mr. Pouncey addressed that in his opening statement on uh, liability issues. So just to, if you have a site that, you, that you've decided, or has been decided that we're not going to go forward on, do you, is it remediated or does it just sit there with the contaminants and in, in I don't, and is that, and that might even not be a good question, but I don't know what 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 happens to those sites. They sit there until somebody comes along later and, to try to the, redevelop. Until the leadership, until the political leadership is there to right. say, I I want to, I want my staff who has limited staff time to go out and tackle this site. Within Lawrence, these are sites that are just. They're off the tax rolls. The city's taken them for tax. tax like it could be an old gas station or something like um, that. Yes. One, one dry cleaner. Or others are, yeah, we, we have a dry cleaning um, site that is now a, a, a park. Um, but, but or former manufacturing facilities just nestled between a river right. 
school and residential areas that, that just aren't ripe for redevelopment, and, and the city's trying to figure out what to do with them. And, and I think, as uh, Mr. Pouncey has noted, you really need a private partner right. to, 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 to make Move this happen. All. Okay. You, you can't just make it parking. Thanks. Senator? Go ahead, please. If I may, your, your question is a great one because that's where we originally came into um, the, the Brownfields program in the first instance in the mid-1990s. There were dozens and dozens of obstacles to cleanup and redevelopment that were too high to surmount. And steadily, over the decades, EPA and state partners have been lowering those obstacles. There are um, not many that remain, but those that remain can be significant, and we've just addressed many of those. And that's why I return again to the suggestion that I've made a few times, where obstacles remain too significant for the marketplace to respond under existing conditions, the federal government should come in and change the conversation by superinducing the private sector to absorb risk through the use of loan guarantees or expanded grants or expanded access to liability protection. Senator, if, if, I, if I may uh, one uh, comment on that, and I think it's a number that is very reflective of this issue. Uh, we have had a Superfund program in Georgia since 1992. And over the life of that program, which now is 30 years, I guess, uh, we've had about 700 properties put on the our state Superfund list. Uh, and of those, I think now we're approaching 250 or so that have been cleaned up. Mm -hmm. Of the 700 over a 30-year period. You compare that to the Brownfield program, which is a private incentivized program, where we have had 1,300 properties go into the program in just a little over half the time and 750 or so of those properties have okay. come out cleaned up. So you, you compare that enforcement yeah. component versus the private incentive component, and you see the dramatic effect that has on the opportunity for cleanup. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to have to say goodbye. You're going to leave me alone, huh? Obligation. With ICE witnesses? Yes, All thank right. you. Thanks so much. Thanks for running the show. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think uh, Senator Sullivan was here, but he had to leave, so I don't, I don't know of any other... Uh, Republican colleagues will be able to join us this morning. But we have been joined by Senator uh, Padilla, and uh, he is recognized for any questions or comments. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I want to thank you for holding this hearing on the need to reauthorize the EPA's Brownfields program. Uh, the Brownfields program has a long history of supporting safe and responsible redevelopment. And since its inception, it has made nearly 10,000 properties ready for reuse, many of which are in my home state of California, many of which are in my hometown of Los Angeles, and many of which are literally in my backyard in the neighborhood where I grew up in Pacoima, California. I've seen uh, and worked on these issues uh, as a state legislator, putting state government resources uh, to, to, to leverage with federal resources in redevelopment, and I'm familiar with uh, these efforts uh, once upon a time, it's a city council member trying to navigate some of these cleanup efforts and uh, efforts at redevelopment for uh, productive uh, use and economic benefit, often in, in uh, underserved communities. Um, Mr. Bush, I appreciated your written testimony for touching on the challenges of deindustrialization. Uh, the example I want to focus on today is actually not in my backyard, but in the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, the shipping industry was the lifeblood of San Francisco's Bayview Hunters Point neighborhood for decades. And the concentration of industrial sites has resulted in more than 150 brownfields in Bayview Hunters Point, many of which are now further threatened by sea level rise. So we see a convergence of challenges here. The actual shipyard itself is now a federal Superfund site and one of America's most polluted places. Now, just last week, San Francisco broke ground on a project that will connect disadvantaged communities and Bayview Hunters Point to the kind of outdoor recreation opportunities that other shoreline neighborhoods in San Francisco have long enjoyed. Working with the EPA and a diverse group of community partners, 
San Francisco is redeveloping a 13-mile corridor of green space with trails and parks along the waterfront. Redevelopment of this site would not have been possible without first cleaning up the contaminated soil, debris, and structures on the property, efforts which were supported by EPA's Brownfields program. Now, in a few short years, thanks to this program, the community members in Bayview Hunters Point will be able to enjoy shoreline trails on what was once an abandoned and blighted former industrial site. Now, this project was successful thanks to the engagement and support from various state and local entities. While the project received almost $350,000 from the EPA Brownfields program, the city also leveraged separate EPA funds as well as other sources of funding. But not every environmental justice community has the same access to technical assistance to be able to complete projects. There are surely other federal agencies that can and should be brought into the Brownfields redevelopment projects. So my question is actually for Mr. Goldstein. How should we think about a whole of government approach to funding Brownfield redevelopment projects and improving interagency coordination? That is a great question, Senator. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, you're absolutely right. There are other agencies that should be part of this conversation and should be providing resources. I identified three that are under this committee's jurisdiction in my testimony earlier this morning. The um, Federal Highway Administration, the Army Corps of Engineers, which has massive resources to bring to the table and can absolutely partner and collaborate with environmental justice communities in an immediate and very material way and um, the Economic Development Administration. The uh, EPA has put out a wonderful guidance document, which they've been doing every several years, called the Federal Brownfields Program, which identifies the aspirational brownfield agendas within 24 different federal agencies and departments. But if you look at what's actually happening in the uh, brownfields universe, Really, EPA is the only agency that has any meaningful involvement. So what I would suggest is um, a, a corollary to a friendly amendment to the testimony I gave earlier. Have EDA convene a national brownfields summit. Bring representatives from each of those 24 agencies and departments to the table, along with private and public sector stakeholders, state, local, tribal, NGOs, environmental justice, et cetera, and collectively identify what resource, human resources and financial resources each of these agencies that are already part of the federal brownfields constellation can bring to the table. And, and specific to reauthorization, which is what this hearing is about, uh, again, we recommend new funding resources be uh, allocated specifically to the core, specifically to EDA, and specifically to F FHA for these purposes. And let's put our thumb on the scale to prioritize funding for EJ communities and rural communities. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know my time is up. I'd like to ask one quick follow-up question for Mr. Goldstein. You know, another reason this uh, project was so successful is because San Francisco accounted for potential climate change and sea level rise impacts by using EPA's Brownfields Cleanup Alternatives Checklist. For example, they chose soil excavation as the preferred cleanup method as opposed to remediation uh, because it would reduce the risk of remobilizing soil contaminants as sea levels continue to rise. How can the EPA ensure that climate change and potential sea level rise are adequately considered during brownfield redevelopment efforts? And uh, if I can ask for a brief response and we'll, we'll continue the conversation after the hearing. Absolutely, Senator Padilla, thank you. And I'm glad you asked the question because it gives me an opportunity to supplement my response to Senator Whitehouse on this very same issue. EPA is laser focused on climate change and brownfields. They've released several guidance documents that are encyclopedic in the way in which they approach this uh, particular challenge, including focusing on, as you pointed out, source removal in coastal areas as a remedy. Why is that important? That's important because if you leave contaminated soil in place and it's subject to flooding, the waters rise and soak through that contaminated material. And like a sponge that may contain hot chocolate that's wiped up from a kitchen counter, that material is going to leak out of the soil or the sponge and further exacerbate contamination in communities. 
So our remedies at the regulatory level should be focused on source removal as the first component of a climate change strategy for brownfields. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I know my time is up. I'll submit questions for the record relative to uh, the uh, uh, recommendation or suggestion of codifying some of our environmental justice and equity directives into the Brownfields program. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for joining us and, and for your participation in questions. The, um, I have a, a couple more questions I want to ask before, uh, before we break um, uh, for, the, uh, the, for the day. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Pouncey, I think you mentioned, uh, I had to go out of the room for a while. We, uh, we served on a bunch of different committees. And one of my committees, uh, environment, uh, the Homeland Security Committee, was uh, marking, voting on a bunch of nominations and legislation. I had to, to go. They needed somebody to show up and give them a quorum. And so I was happy to do that. So it's a little bit of what was going on, but not too much. But I'm told, uh, Mr. Pouncey, that uh, you mentioned addressing uh, developer liability as a, a way to, um, to better uh, incentivize redevelopment. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, Mr. I think Mr. Goldstein, I'm told by my staff that you may have started to touch on uh, on this uh, and some, some approaches in this regard uh, in, uh, in your earlier comments. But let me just ask each of you uh, to, uh, if you would just describe for us ways that this might be accomplished, so this might be accomplished while still incentivizing um, health protection. So. Again, uh, Mr. Ponce, you, you mentioned addressing developer liability as a way to better incentivize redevelopment. And then the question would be to ask each of you to describe ways that this might be accomplished uh, while still incentivizing health protection. And uh, Mr. Bush, would you like to go first? Um, liability associated with ownership of brownfield sites is a barrier for all actors, whether they're they're trying to create parks or they're trying to redevelop sites, um, within Lawrence, the, the the state administers the brownfield program except for contaminants covered by Tosca. Um, covenants not to sue have been used through the through the state AG's office uh, to to absolve future owners of brownfields, um, particularly in certain park projects. And I think that it's been a barrier for us to act on certain park projects as well to take ownerships when um, ownerships of properties when they are presented to us um, and they fit within our long-term vision for the city. All right, thank you. Mr. Ponce, you, you are, you are, I think you may have raised this. Go ahead. And any, any further comments you have, please share them. Yeah, yes, Senator. I, I do think that as part of the reauthorization, they, there may want to be some consideration to, to looking at a number of the states that have enacted liability protection and see if that uh, if that can be applied to the federal side as well for those brownfield buyers, I would I would note that there there is still the requirement that you perform the cleanup that is a, agreed upon. So that uh, that is the way to ensure the health and safety of uh, of those who might be impacted by uh, uh, by liability relief. But I would also remind us that Superfund took a very remarkable approach when it was first drafted, and it has done tremendous things for this country. Uh, but it did impose the liability upon an owner of property, whether they had caused the contamination, whether they had owned it when it occurred or not. Mm -hmm. And so I do think that that is a disincentive in many instances for buyers as, the, as they have an opportunity to acquire this property versus a greenfield. Uh, very often they choose to invest their resources somewhere else which prevents that property from actually being cleaned up. So I do think liability protection is a tool that should be considered as part of the reauthorization. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Cargo, same question. Could you describe for us ways that this might be accomplished while still incentivizing uh, health protection? Uh, I want to completely agree with these with these gentlemen here. Um, one thing in West Virginia I would add that, you know, we have our, our state voluntary remediation program, and that program does provide that liability protection and that's oftentimes the only way you can really get a site to be cleaned up, ready to go, and everybody on the private side agrees with you. They, they see it, they, they realize that, that all the effort has been made, and uh, uh, that to me is one of the best routes to, to always try to, to keep in mind. But I, I will agree with these gentlemen that the, the, the liability aspects, many, many times, the site ends up just sitting there because of, of that big challenge there and trying to trying to handle that. It, it, it's a big hurdle, that's yeah. for sure. 
All right, thank you. And Mr. Goldstein, uh, uh, I think when I was out of the room uh, attending my other hearing, uh, you may have started to touch on some approaches in this regard. Uh, so Mr. Goldstein, if you have, uh, if you'd like to just jump in here and share with us what I may have missed, anything else you want to add on this front, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll try and be brief. We had some discussion earlier in the testimony about the tension between the Superfund program at the federal level and many state brownfield programs across the country and that the liability protections um, offered under both programs were mutually exclusive. It was impossible. It's impossible in many states to take advantage of uh, either um, liability protection incentive if you are not in that same program. So the specific incentive that I that I would offer that I think would be very meaningful would be a, a, a very narrow and discreet amendment to the Superfund statute to CERCLA that provides that any party that enters into a state-based brownfield voluntary cleanup agreement automatically has contribution defense and other defenses against third-party claims under federal Superfund law. That way you get the best of both worlds and you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about EPA relinquishing its enforcement discretion. That's a, a very, uh, again, discreet and I think meaningful approach that could immediately be taken by Congress to expand the scope of liability protection available to developers who may be able to address their state-based state ex legal exposure, but not their federal legal exposure to third parties. This um, uh, uh, butters two pieces of bread with one knife. And Did you say it butters other, two pieces of bread with one knife? You, excuse me? Did you say butters two pieces of bread with one knife? Yes. That's exactly that's right. One of the highlights of this hearing. This has been a great hearing, but that's one of, one of my favorite aspects. Go right ahead. And, and then I would also reinforce the point that that uh, Mr. Pouncey made, and that is to ensure continued protection of human health and keep developers on task with respect to the cleanup. This is a, a quid pro quo environment we're operating in. All of the incentives, especially the liability protection incentives, remain viable insofar as a developer compl complies with their cleanup and public health obligations. If they fail to do so, the incentives are lost, including the liability protection incentive. All right, thank you. I mean, uh, I have uh, about uh, three, three or four other questions and I'm gonna ask you to respond to them just very briefly, if if you could. And, uh, and we'll call it, uh, call it a morning. But uh, the, uh, the first one uh, deals with um, local, uh, local engagement. Brownfield, uh, Cleanups, uh, as we know, involve government at all levels, federal government and state and, and local. Feds uh, provide the, uh, the cleanup money, the seed money, through uh, grant funding, and state governments dictate the cleanup standards for the most part. Uh, local governments make uh, land use decisions and have ultimate control over what brownfield re redevelopment is ultimately going to look like. Um, this is uh, critical because remediated land has the potential to provide, as you know, huge benefits. Uh, to impact the communities. We've seen it in our own communities, very close to where I live, and I'm sure you've seen it in your own. Um, the, uh, a question for the panel, but especially for Mr. Bur uh, Busher and Mr. Carrico. Uh, and, uh, but if our other colleagues would like to, 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 to comment, you're welcome to do that too. But we'll start off with uh, Mr. Busher and Mr. Carrico. Why is the local involvement so important for brownfield redevelopment, and how can we improve our outreach to local governments and individual communities impacted by Brownfield's uh, redevelopment. Mr. Busher. Um, residents just want to be heard and they want to know what's going on. They, they, they want to be kept in the loop. It's so important to keep them in the loop. I, I think we've all been to a public meeting that have got, kind of gone off the rails when, when residents have, been, have not been properly communicated with. But I'll just give a quick plug to um, to avenues for engagement, and that's the Groundwork Trust Network. We reach over six million people living in environmental justice communities across the country, um, over 75% of whom are people of color. Uh, we support the city's efforts to prepare and draft the, the cleanup and the assessment proposals by providing those statistics that others have referenced is so hard to access. Expansion of the network which was created, the expansion of the Groundwork ne Network, which is created with support from the National Park Service and EPA, as well as local stakeholders, will go a long way to achieving the engagement goals within urban areas, but I would also say rural areas as well. 
Um, let's not overlook the smaller and mid-sized cities. We're in Mobile, Alabama. We're in Atlanta. We're in Erie, PA. Um, the network is strong and can bring a lot of expertise to local decision makers. All right, thank you. Mr. Kako? <clears throat> yes, first, first uh, uh, great comments there. Uh, the big thing we find on the local community with, with, with that local engagement piece is they want to be told the real story. The, the rumor mill goes around and around and around, and a lot of times you, they, they are misinformed about a particular property as to what it can or can't be uh, uh, used for and then what's going on with it. Uh, providing that local uh, engagement piece, that gives them the opportunity where they can be heard and they can provide their input on, uh, on what's going on on that property, how, it, how the future redevelopment of it's going to uh, affect them, and, and then when you do run into issues at the local level, it, th that platform can then be addressed. And this Brownfield program, you know, the way it's set up uh, with that local engagement and community engagement piece, it, it provides that, that framework, if you would, where that, that can be conducted. So uh, it, it's a great way to get the story out, get everybody involved, and come together with some consensus on, on how everything is progressing forward. So that, that would be my comments. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Carrico. And, and uh, if uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Pouncey, if you want to add to that, feel free. And uh, Mr. Uh, Goldstein, if you want to add to those comments, feel free. But you don't have to. Go ahead, Mr. Pouncey. Uh, any? The, uh, the comments uh, by those individuals from right and left are, are, are spot on. Uh, and, and fundamental part of all of our redevelopments is engagement with those local communities. And that's a fundamental part of the zoning process. And I, I do not see very many developers that are successful if they don't understand that fundamental. Yeah, people like to be asked. People like to be asked. Um, Mr. Goldstein, before I ask uh, my, my other questions, do you want to add anything on this front? No, sir. OK. All right. One down, uh, 14 to go. So. <laughs> or maybe not that many. All right. Um, we know this is, is uh, deals with brown brownfields remediation uh, planning, and this would be for the uh, the entire panel. But uh, we know that uh, thoughtful planning is vitally important part of land remediation, and that uh, pro uh, the program program over time has been uh, reformed to uh, include more support for the planning portions of uh, brownfield uh, redevelopment. And for the whole uh, panel, uh, what can we do in Congress to uh, further strengthen federal support for brownfield planning. So the communities um, not only engage uh, in site-by-site -site planning, but uh, can de uh, dedicate time and resources to develop regional or area-wide plans to, to land revitalization so that authorities can develop more comprehensive land use goals and plans for their communities. That was a pretty long question. I'd be happy to repeat that if anybody wants me to. But uh, Mr. Bush, would you like to take a shot at that? Sure. Um, I've, I've been fortunate to participate in an EPA area-wide planning project. It looked at, um, it's probably around 10 acres north, of south, north and south of the city's main, main commercial corridors. Um, that set the stage for the city to create a new urban renewal plan uh, and, and hopefully in 2023, we will begin construction on the rail trail that bisects that planning area. Um, these, these funds were really vital to starting to have the conversation with not only with property owners about thinking what they could do for the entire district with their individual small parcels, but also starting the, um, the underlying zoning and making sure that the right overlay district is there reflecting the community's interests and the overall goals of the city. Um, and then just building support for the conversion of the corridor to, to an uh, alternative transportation corridor. It was, it was a really good project and hopefully um, the reauthorization will continue supporting it. All right, thank you. Um, again, uh, just a brief comment if you have, Mr. Pouncey. Same question, long question. I'm looking for a fairly short answer. It's, uh, I'm always careful to uh, to have EPA get involved in in uh, land use planning. Uh, I think that's obviously much more effective at the 
local or regional level uh, where, where they're, they're on the ground. Uh, but I do think that there are areas where grants can be incentivized in certain forms, uh, mm -hmm. transit being one, a great example of that. Uh, and there are a number of other categories like that where uh, where there's an ability to incentivize investment uh, through grants, re receiving extra points, or receiving uh, some level of priority uh, if they are if they meet with those categories. Transit, once again, being the obvious Good. example. Thanks for that example, Mr. Carco. I'll just add a quick comment to that. Um, you know, with the brownfield funding, you, know, you can use some of that funding for conducting planning activities. And I've seen that work both, uh, we've had communities that they already had some things in place, but there was some additional work done. Maybe it was a feasibility study or a market analysis or a structural analysis or whatever. And it turned out that their original plans were really not the best plans. So those things got changed a little bit. So I, I, I see very positive results that, 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 that have come from that. But again, that, that has to be done at that local level. And uh, uh, having our brownfield funding to help with that is is a is a big key. That that that's part of the whole cleanup plan. Is is that 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 key right there as well? All right, thank you. Um, oh, oh, about two more questions, if I could. Uh, uh, it's been uh, well uh, documented that uh, lower-income communities and racial minorities uh, are disproportionately exposed to environmental harm. We've seen that in my own uh, statement. In fact, frankly, not far from where uh, my wife and I live. But there are concerns that uh, development of brownfields can do unintended harm by displacing the, uh, the people who live there. For, for example, with remediation, there can be an influx of zoning planning and privately funded new development that can, turn, uh, can in turn uh, cause rents to rise above what community members can can afford. And again, for the, the entire uh, panel, this question, how can we incentivize private entities that invest in brownfield development to ensure that remediate sites benefit the communities where they are located and create sustainable long-term in infrastructure improvement for community residents? And if I could, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Goldstein to lead off on that one, please. Sure, I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and, and this is the unfortunate secret uh, in our in our world, in the brownfields redevelopment world, the unintended consequence of environmental redevelopment, re revitalization, gentrification. The opposite of gentrification is anchoring in place. So how do we help um, communities that have long been in the neighborhood remain in that neighborhood? Uh, we do that by qualifying private sector incentives with uh, responsibilities and obligations to partner with local residents and local organizations. We require them to take on local partners. We require them to provide mentoring programs, job creation programs, job training programs. We require them to establish micro lending programs to invest in cultural amenities in, um, in gathering places and the like. And all of this uh, could be um, uh, included in what one might call generically a um, anti-gentrification plan, which could be uh, a, a, a condition to the award of any federal brownfield grant. All right, thank you, Mr. Carrico. Same question. I, I really don't have any additional comments to make on that. All right, thank you, sir. Mr. Mr. Pouncey. It's a, uh, it is an issue, and, and we see it. Uh, we've uh, we've seen it dealt with at the local level. I can point to a number of developments that, that, uh, that I have uh, been involved in in Charleston, South Carolina, where there's been a tremendous amount of public involvement and comment uh, to ensure that the local communities are not just informed, but also involved and, and participated. Uh, I, I don't know the, uh, the federal role in that. Uh, where I have seen it most effectively considered has been at the local level. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Thank you. Mr. Busher. Uh, green gentrification is a concern for groundwork and our, the work we do within the city. Uh, displacement is an issue within Lawrence. There is a significant housing crisis. And there's a significant affordability crisis. I, I was intrigued by some of the con uh, concepts Mr. Goldstein 
put forward earlier that, that called for enhanced low income housing tax credits associated with brownfield development to actually make it more appealing to private sector developers to come in instead of doing full 100% market rate housing, that perhaps there's other incentives that can be provided from the federal government to make sure that a certain share of those units created fall to those who are most unable to afford housing within that city. All right, thank you, sir. And one last question. This uh, would also be a, a question for the uh, the entire panel. And the, the question goes something like this. Before uh, we uh, discussed earlier, we discussed the detailed policy issues. And I want to ask each of you to just share with us um, briefly your experiences on, on what the Brownfields program has meant uh, to communities you work with. Um, can, uh, can you give some idea of uh, your, uh, some briefly, uh, an experience or two that, uh, that you've uh, gone through and how the program has transformed not just land but the lives of people living in affected communities? So something from your, uh, from your own experience, Mr. Carrico, would you like to share with us a memory or two? I could actually talk for quite a while on that subject. I'll just share with you. I shared a couple examples in my uh, comments earlier, but one that's uh, very in interesting and close to my to, to me is a little project in Cerrito, West Virginia. There, Tell people where Cerrito is. Uh, it is in Wayne County, uh, near the tip with uh, Kentucky and Ohio. There you can see both from there. Um, there was there's a group called the Golden Girls Group Home. And uh, I yearn to live there someday <laughs> in the distant, distant future. Don't tell my wife. Uh, uh, great. It's a great name, but uh, it is a home that was built for uh, young ladies that have came, I'll just say, from horrific home mm. conditions. Mm. And it's a place for them to get a second chance. Oh, that's get great. a new start. They get safe housing. They get counseling. Uh, they get uh, help with educational assistance and work uh, and to find jobs. It is a wonderful program. They first approached me back some years ago about a particular piece of property and said, we hope to build our facility there. Mm. I did some research on it. I'm an environmental geologist by trade, so I have a background in that. So I did a little look and I said, you know, there are some issues with this project. Rather than getting into the Brownfield side of it, I said, do you all have any other properties? They said, yeah, we have a second location that just came up, and we think it could even be the better location. Mm. So real quick, I uh, did a little look, look into that, and I said, you know, it's a vacant property that nobody seems to know anything about. So let's find out for sure. We used, uh, we, we had the Wayne County EDA, the head of Brownfields Grant, and I was working with them, and I said, let's, let's do a, a Phase one environmental site assessment on the property just to see what's the, the history of this site to make sure there's no recognized environmental conditions. They did a phase one at that time. I suspect that cost was no more than about $4,000. Mm -hmm. and, and there were no recognized environmental issues on that property. That jump started it and cleared the way for. I have no idea how many private investors that came in, the local hospitals, local businesses, they all said, okay, we, we, we see you've done your homework and we want to be involved with this. And now the facility has been built. All these young ladies, they, they go there, they have a place to stay. Uh, it's a, th those little stories like that really make your day, quite frankly. Right. And it all got started because we did a little background work just to make sure they weren't getting ready as we say in West Virginia, to buy a pig and a poke. Yeah. Getting ready to take on something that had environmental challenges that they would not be able to handle. That's a great story. And, and yeah. We don't like anymore, but I'll stop for No, that's great. That's great. Mr. Pouncey. Yes. So if it, uh, there's one particular project that comes to mind. Back in the 60s when the interstates were being built, uh, when what we call our downtown connector in Atlanta was built, it split the east side and the west side of it. Sounds like. familiar. There's a lot of places like that around and, the country. And, that, uh, and all of the growth occurred on the east side. The only thing on the west side was a little school called Georgia Tech and, uh, and an area and an old 100-acre steel mill called the Atlantic Steel Mill. It, uh, it was operating on a skeletal crew, so it avoided some of the EPA closure requirements. It was still considered to be, quote, operating. Well, in the late 90s, 
we put together a group that ultimately redeveloped that steel mill. It had laid uh, in its underutilized capacity for about, I think at that time, for close to 20 years. Uh, and what it did is it sparked so many things on the west side of Atlanta, ultimately resulting in a bridge that now connects the east side and the west side of Atlanta up in that area, mm -hmm. in what we call 17th Street, created grocery stores in areas that had no grocery stores, created affordable restaurants in areas where it had no place to eat, resulted in additional schools being built, resulted in significant infrastructure improvement. All of that was started, the seed that was planted was the Atlantic Station redevelopment. And fortunately, we, uh, it did receive uh, EPA's Brownfield Redevelopment of the Year back in 2000. Oh, that's great. Wonderful story. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Busher? Um, similar to the rest of the individuals up here, I could have several stories. Um, one that comes to mind is the Manchester Street Park site, which is former rail yard um, right on Stevens Pond um, in the Arlington and um, Malden Mills uh, district of Lawrence. Um, when we did the park, when the city and groundwork did the park, all of the mills were, were quite dilapidated, and now there are there are hundreds of units of housing around the pond and near near the park. The rail trail is is going to be built. It abuts it, and that connects to 30 miles of additional trails, and um, and it's the beginning or the end of the Spicker River Greenway, and this park serves as that 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 hub for the hundreds of families that now call that mill mill section home. Okay, thank you. And um, how about one more story, uh, Mr. Goldstein, from you, please? Absolutely. There's a there's a story that's being written right now, a project that's underway involving a 100-year-old site, which is pretty old for Miami. Miami is not that much older than 100 years. It is in a neighborhood called Overtown. It's in the southwest quadrant of Overtown, a historic African-American community that had been split in two by I-95 many years ago. This particular site is uh, bordered by uh, Booker T. Washington High School, which is the second oldest African-American high school in South Florida and adjacent to a uh, metro rail station that connects to the county's largest job engine. Uh, this particular site has sat idle for over 30 years as a result of uh, a pretty horrific spill of chlorinated solvents from a janitorial chemical supply company using the federal brownfields program and the state brownfields program uh, one of our clients came in acquired the site cleaned it up brought in a best in class affordable housing developer who was able to close because of the affordable housing incentives offered by the federal government the fact that the site is in an opportunity zone the fact that there is state brownfields liability protection and they are now going to invest $250 million in this site to build 612 units of affordable housing and put in a fresh food, fresh food grocer in what is currently a food desert. So you now have the connectivity between transit, schools, housing, and the county's largest job engine, which is the health district. This is more, this is, this is more than just environmental science, this is poetry. Well, thank you for that uh, for that poetry. I um, I once asked uh, Bill Clinton a question. He'd come and spoken at a um, um, our annual uh, Democratic Senate retreat uh, had over the Library of Congress, and he spoke before lunch and after. He just he killed it. He was just crushed it. He was just so good, and it's the uh, delivering his stories that he told. And I uh, I said to him as we going through the chow line, I said, Mr. President, I've heard you speak many times, but. Uh, I've always, I've never asked you like, why are you so effective as a, uh, as a speaker? And he said, Tom, what I do is I, I tend to tell uh, stories. He said, I tell a series of stories that put together can explain more complex concepts. He said, people understand stories. You draw them in, they, they get it. And uh, he said, I like to use uh, some uh, self-deprecating humor. But that's, he said, when I do that, I'm usually fairly effective. And I find that, uh, I, when I do those things, uh, I'm fairly effective as well. I think maybe the most effective part of the, a terrific uh, hearing has been just what you've closed with. Those are wonderful stories. 
that we can all uh, get our heads and our hearts uh, around. And I want to thank you for, for, uh, for, for, for those um, and for being here with, uh, with us and for Mr. Uh, Mr. Goldstein uh, to, uh, to you and your neighbors down there in, in Florida. We're sending up some prayers for, for all of you, hoping that uh, you come through this uh, okay. We'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of um, interest in providing federal assistance and, uh, from others around in, uh, the country or not from government at all, but just want to do it because they want to be a good neighbor. Um, for, uh, uh, for, uh, we, uh, we adjourn a little bit of housekeeping that, um, uh, we, you know, we have to let our senators, uh, some, some over here will want to ask some more questions for the record. Some who couldn't join us will want to ask some questions for the record. And we'll ask our, our uh, colleagues to uh, submit the written questions for the record through the close of business on uh, Wednesday, October the 12th. And uh, we'll compile those, uh, those questions. We'll send them out to each of you and ask you to reply by Wednesday, October 26th uh, of this year. And uh, I, I want to again thank uh, our, um, our staff sir, on the majority side, the minority side, for helping us put together really a good hearing. This is an important issue. It's been an important issue for a long time. And uh, yeah, I bet every member of this panel, Democrat, Republican, could tell a story, as, as, or a bunch of stories that really would mirror what we've heard from each of you in, in, uh, in, in your close. But I want to thank our, our staffs for putting, uh, making it possible to have this great hearing. And for those who are able to participate on our, uh, on our uh, panel, uh, on our uh, members of the committee, thank them for, for joining us, especially Senator Capito. Um, anything else? Anything else that you want? All right, I'd like to say uh, going, going, gone. This hearing is, is adjourned. Thank you all so much. God bless.